Hello, I'm here with Robert Dutton, ASGFA, and he's going to talk to us about um, the four exhibition pieces he's got in the Centenary Unlocked exhibition at the Moore Galleries, and also more broadly about his artistic practice and influences. So hello, Robert. Hello, pleased to meet you. It's a, a delight to be here. And uh, of course, it's even more so to have uh, four paintings in uh, the SGFA show. Uh, I'm back at the Mall again, so I'm uh, thrilled about that. So uh, contributing work to the big collection. So what a thrill. It's, it's brilliant. And also for anybody who isn't familiar um, with how it works, for associate members of the society, four is the maximum number of works that they can have included. So um, Robert has done especially well to get all four of his um, pieces included in the show. So, <laughs> and as you can see right behind me, I'm going to move my head away. So here we have one of my favourite mountains. Uh, this one is Helvellyn and uh, that was converted into black and white, um, which is in the uh, book. And then we've got some of these on this side, which are of um, Borrowdale, which is amazing. And then on this sort of side over here, we have a, a winterscape of... Uh... Uh, lots of exciting things happening for you. I know you've got a, a book that has just come out with Searchlight, um, and some of your pictures are included in that. So we're going to talk a little bit about the new book and how that came about. Um, and I'd love to know who, who the biggest inspiration behind your, your work is. So how did, how did you become inspired to become an artist? Well, uh, I think I, could, I remember I could um, draw near enough as soon as I could uh, sort of crawl. But the biggest influence, uh, I have to admit, was my own father. I was always intrigued by um, when I used to sneak upstairs to his office and he used to be quietly beavering away on the um, architectural drawings that he was doing. And I just thought, I'd love to do that. You know, that real precision and mark and, and the craft skill. And it was really sort of like therapeutic to sort of watch him. And then my dad was always um, surrounded as the family was by other artists. So uh, we have uh, a New Zealand uh, family called the Browns, who used to uh, be coming regularly and we'd go to them. And then my father had uh, friends from his ex-uni days who were um, really accomplished watercolorists. And it was lovely just to, you know, look at that kind of uh, work and be influenced by that as I was growing up. And then I had an artistic leaning, which was mainly towards uh, the arts and uh, it was sort of set in stone near enough that that was going to be uh, my career so uh, off I went down that route. <laughs> Drawing is all about the foundation that goes into everything you do as an artist I mean I've got work behind the back of me here which actually uh, has work in progress and we're finished but the drawing Drawing is important because that is the foundation with everything you'll do as an artist and everything else can be built on it. And then after it, when I'm actually uh, working away, having work through ideas, um, when I, I actually choose painting medium, I'm actually drawing with the brush as well. So a lot of the kind of the way that the, the Chinese work, uh, they, they express and draw and move that brush in a very, very fluid uh, way. So it's not just laying on kind of flat colors, if, if, if you know what I mean, and, and building up that sort of layering. It, it's like beautifully expressive, the way that they can twist and turn the brush. So um, drawing with the brush, constantly having that in mind, and that multiple layering is, is, is what's very much behind uh, my ethos as, a, as an artist. So, uh, yeah, it's an exciting process, I must admit. <laughs> Definitely. Um, so you do a lot, a lot of 
um, outdoor, on plein air uh, work. And one, that's, that's a very brave thing to do in the UK with our weather. Um, how, how did that start? Did you always work outdoors? Um, for me, uh, the outdoors, bringing the outdoors in is, is the way I present it in framed work. Um, but realistically, it was it's back in those days when I, I couldn't even afford a kind of like camera and that sort of thing. So everything was actually had to be recorded. You had to get down all your information that you saw and bring it back to the studio. There was none of that sort of uh, expensive you know, digital cameras in those days were just completely unheard of when I first started. So it was cameras, you had to learn how to use them, you had to either hire them or buy them, film, film processing. It was quicker to actually go out there and draw. And also it's that direct contact with um, what's out there. And the expression of, you know, nature and weather and, and what's around you and, and, and all of those sorts of things are put within the work and texture plays a massive part with with what I do. So it's kind of like sampling those different types of things from the landscape and uh, incorporating that in a very personal, expressive way in, in the drawings and uh, what I'm actually presenting to, to, um, to the show. Quite interesting to pick up on that is sort of say it was almost out of necessity because it was easier to do the drawing than it was to take a photograph which is just such an alien concept now when there's <laughs> nothing easier than to get your phone out and take a snapshot yeah it i, I find being outdoors is is, is very much a, a, a tactile um tangible thing to sort of do and uh it's it's heart and soul that's in the work and what's around you i'm always in awe of, of the mountains and landscapes and the coast and and nature really so uh what's just on that piece of paper that's that's also created uh you know is is, is from nature as well because if you think about the kind of different types of paper that we use um it it kind of sort of is this sort of toing and froing and and interconnection really and for yeah. somebody who was I was thinking about picking up a, an outdoor easel for the first time and or maybe just picking up a sketchbook for the first time and going outdoors into nature and starting to draw what advice would you give them so things i would definitely avoid is uh, the kitchen sink <laughs> because loads and loads of people what they think is oh, i have to have this i have to have that this that and the other that all the time they just sort of like cram it into their bag and then they just think, you know, it, it, what happens if this situation evolves or this or this, you know, then before long you've got this huge amount of weight and you don't need it. And then tomorrow's another day and then there's another day after that and another experience. So just taking things that you feel very, very comfortable with is, is the main thing. I mean, I, I use uh, a very lightweight easel and sometimes I'll just create uh, a board. I can just fit it underneath my arm uh, in case we get inclement weather. The uh, plastic bags that you get that wrap around your watercolour papers, they'll fit over the top. Bulldog clip it together. Nice and easy. You've got things within the environment uh, and adapt. You know, if what would happen, say you broke your easel, would you have a dicky fit and, and stay at home? The answer is no, you go out there and lean it against stones and perhaps work above it. And I do a lot of that anyway at different angles here and, and so on. So taking it off the easel and putting it on the floor and working on it and, and that kind of thing. Uh, so the actual tactile involvement is, is useful. So. And don't think all the time that you're going out there to create a masterpiece. What you're going out there is a personal record of uh, what's around you. And you can turn the next one over and the next one and turn the sheet over. These are personal responses to, to what you do. You've worked in the Lake District and the East Yorkshire coast. And what is it about those particular areas that really appeal to you? 
These are unique environments. I mean, when I used to uh, be growing up, I was from Lancashire originally, and it was just straight up the M6. It was just, you know, easy to go and have fun and games in, in the Lake District, uh, canoeing, climbing, um, walking, whatever we were doing together, camping and, and all those different types of things. And then as an artist, I started to develop it and I started to record things, started to see all the different types of uh, environment and then was starting to tune into Lakeland artists as well the Heaton Coopers and more of the Lakeland artist team that's that's there now, uh, great all-rounded individuals. Um, and the moors uh, are, are great areas to escape and the coast has a, you know, the sublime landscape of all three, coast, moors, dales, is fantastic. They're all unique environments. The north in particular, um, I would say is, you know, organically um it is uh you know what can we say it's 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 large it's it's in your face it, it's got um you know dramatic angles and cliffs look at bempton for example they'll definitely rival the white cliffs of dover um the history that's behind it and a man's uh, in tune and then out of tune and overlapping with the environment and this constant thing that's in flux for example in the South Pennines I have a lot of my influence is uh, to do with the ruins and the way we've had uh, ancient land clearing to build reservoirs and dams and all that kind of thing so uh, and farmers who've hill farmers who've been on the edge and they've not been able to make it but they've left behind a legacy and the, the way that they are built are like sentinels in the landscape, they're homesteads. And then when we move across to the Lake District, you look at what was once mining, um, and again, up in Mooka and Swaledale and, and that kind of thing and beyond, all the old mine workings and the ruins that are there, they're just peppered over our, our kind of industrial heritage. and. Uh, there to be discovered and um, I brought them back to see for for a lot of people who were in London and, and, and that kind of thing what's happening here in the north and what we have uh, that rich tapestry um, in in previous shows so uh, and people just love them and I can see why really because they are quite compelling to draw and paint. You were uh, elected to the society in 2020 and um, so you're quite quite a new associate how did you hear about it and what what made you want to go and apply in the first place um for me i heard about the sgfa uh through lots of different organizations and like social media and and so on but one of the deciding factors was i was working with a book working on a book with uh, Cynthia Barlow-Mars, who's uh, a fully um, uh, associate member. And this particular book was called uh, Artist Drawing Techniques, and that was with Dorling uh, Kindersley, uh, DK Life. I took the pastel section and uh, Cynthia was doing the drawings. We both admired each other's work and then we kept in touch. And then uh, I said I would probably like to apply to the uh, you know SGFA and she said we'll go for it and uh, the rest of the history so I owe uh, Cynthia quite a, a bit at least a, a wine or a something else at some point but yes clink our glasses together at some open but that was thrilling you know to be able then to have the confidence to put the work forward because there's lots of artists within the society who I totally admire, very accomplished artists. And uh, at one point I actually thought, well, I'm not really quite good enough yet. And uh, so I waited and then thought I could offer something unique and different and something of uh, a high standard that would also cement my place within uh, the strata of uh, this wonderful society, which I am immensely proud to belong to. 
and um, it's it's a joy. It's great. It's real uplift. I think what would be really wonderful now would be if you could talk to us a little bit about the four pieces you've got in the the Mall Gallery show, and um, and just sort of go through how they came about, like the stories of how they were made. Brilliant. Yes, yeah, certainly. Well, there are uh, two pieces, most definitely, that are in this uh, brand new book of mine here, which is Drawing uh, Dramatic Landscapes. This is the one by Search Press. Now, the first, let's just look at the one of Whitby. Um, that particular one was, it took about two days, two different visits to, to do that because it was all about the way each one of those buildings at distance and through the uh, sections of that landscape, um, that coastal town, working port actually on the east coast of Yorkshire, Whitby. Um, Dracula, you remember Count Alucard and all that kind of thing, the goth festival that's there at uh, St Mary's Church. Well, well, all of that, uh, that was in the kind of like same location. It was over from the church overlooking the town. So it was kind of like a nice, quiet, um, you know, viewpoint really, right at the, the far end, far from the uh, madding crowds, as they say. So I was able to use uh, nitram liquid charcoal and also nitram, uh, who I kind of represent here in the UK, and put together on a pastel paper this really long uh, drawing. And it was fantastic to do, really. And just, it cemented my um, period of graphic design. So it has a geometric um, approach and then looseness of expression as well which is more fine art so it, it ties many things in together and I want to keep it really pure this particular one of uh, black and white and just a little bit of half tone grey in there so um, it's mainly uh, wash and um, line so that, that took quite a lot of concentration but it was really worth it of the Lake District was a little quiet corner where lots of the canoeists go and park their canoes and uh, by a long wall and then you've got all those super duper reeds now it's a very kind of textured environment all that lovely lakeland stone and the soft reeds and the weather was changing quite a lot and then you had serenity then you had uh, energy and what I tried to do within that was was show how you've got a man-made structure, which is that wonderful wall, but how it's been made organically. And then you've got a, a surrounding of nature within that intimate view of, of the lake. And then the overhanging trees were casting super duper shadows. And uh, so for me, I, I gave it a little bit of a tint. I used liquid, uh, Graphite, it's a Wallace Seymour product, which is a northern company uh, in Skipton, I believe, in Yorkshire. And so we used uh, the blue and the brown and the grey, and then we worked on top of that with uh, lots of the uh, dark inks and charcoal. Certain parts of the area to help build those textures were rubbed extensively with uh, almost like sandpaper and cut and scratched into lots of scraffito techniques. And that was all built on a beautiful 640 GSM uh, Canson paper, which is Heritage, a very, very strong paper. So that that was uh, a joy to do, actually. I suppose there's two, two technical questions from, from that that I'd ask. Um, one is, with the washes of the charcoal and the liquid graphite, does it behave like an ink or does it really behave very differently? And I suppose the second question would be, when you're saying you're working on such heavyweight papers, would you always go above 600 or for quicker works, would you maybe use a 300 or is it important that it has this very 
heavy, solid, can cope with anything ability within the, the weight of that paper? The paper itself, what I tend to do with my own, um, I can actually layer it and collage my own drawings together, layers and layers. I mean, again, in this, this sort of book, I explain that and show that for Honest to Pass. Paper is fantastic, it's a very tactile medium, more like canvas or uh, unlike a, a board where you've got to guillotine it and, and so on. Paper can be torn and layered and that kind of thing. So that's one of the reasons why I like to work on very, very heavy duty paper. Choosing different media to work with, say for example, you've got liquid graphite. Um, liquid graphite works brilliantly together, then you can, whilst it's still wet, you can manipulate it. Uh, it will act like a resist if you put an awful lot down, which is a wonderful way of then flooding another wash of, say, very uh, um, luminous or transparent ink uh, over the top of that. And uh, Again, you've got that way you can burnish it and move it and, and express elements of the landscape within what you're doing. Thank you so much for sharing that. And what have you got coming up in the next 12 months or so? Well, I'm working very closely at the moment with Derwin. Uh, we've been working on some packaging illustration. We have to keep it a little bit quiet at the moment about what's sort of like going on. But uh, new products, so they've been road tested and it's a, an honour as an associate artist for um, Derwent to uh, be invited and to contribute to doing that. And we're being filmed and helping that sort of uh, promotion side of this uh, wonderfully new media, which I would love to tell you about right now, but I can't. And but you'll see in the future and it'll be a joy for uh, society members and other artists to use its other films I'm working on personally I'm contributing to the artist magazine and then right now I've got two shows in the Lake District um, one's at Higham Hall where I teach I've got about 20 paintings there that are a collection of all my northern images and that kind of things and then at uh, Rydal Hall, which is part of the Diocese of Carlisle, near Grasmere, where I also teach, I have a permanent show on. And uh, that's superb to, to be in the Le Fleming uh, historical uh, home and uh, in this wonderful uh, hall that's open to visitors. You can go and, and see it uh, above Rydal Water and opposite Rydal Mount, which uh, is great to visit too. We've got our wonderful uh, SGFA centenary show in London at the Mall. So uh, yeah, lots lots of things happening. So it's, it's very exciting. That's great. There's loads of exciting things happening for you and particularly getting um, the permanent exhibition. That sounds really good so that you can be on display for all the visitors who go there. Have you found that the lockdown has had a big impact on how you work? Oh, there was, you know, straight away we had that impact, didn't we? I mean, I was at uh, um, Higham Hall uh, in March um, and there was part of the joy for me that we just sold our house in Leeds and we moved here on the 9th of March. So we just moved when um, lockdown happened and then we got the announcement when I was actually on the the course that the government were closing everything down and uh, that was the last course we finished our course and then I came back home and it was just doors closed on everything you know but then a lifeline came when I was able to teach online and that was with uh, shopkeep party so I, I kind of teach courses with them and we've had very, very successful courses. And then I was always keeping going with the artist. They knew that we'd come out locked down and then there was a whole string of, um, you know, articles that needed to be done. So, and it's all that kind of planning ahead and thinking glass half full, really. Because um, now that we're out of this, all of that activity has meant that, um, cogs have still been in motion so it's not suddenly nothing to full on again it, it's a, 
maintain some sense of equilibrium through it. Good to be able to take a bit of time to settle in and get um get a bit of balance back before hitting the ground running at 100 miles an hour again. But thank you so much for sharing a bit about your practice and your techniques, some of the media you've been working with, um, and a, a bit more about the people. Thank you very much for today. It's been a pleasure to uh, introduce myself a little more to members of the show and my work. It's been a thrill. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robert. And uh, I look forward to seeing it in the flesh down in London. Thank you very much. <laughs>